Cool. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is actually the talk that I was uh, intending to present two years ago, um, which at the last minute I swapped for a latency talk. Um, but don't let that make you think that I actually finished it two years ago. I finished it quite, quite a bit more recently. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about MIMO and easy ways to use it from within uh, GNU Radio. So um, my, uh, my first brush with MIMO came, actually, I can remember back to when I was in fifth grade and um, I was coming home from my friend's house in his parents' car and they had the radio on and there were these two flickering amber LEDs next to each other. And I asked what that was and it, it turned out it was indicating which of the two antennas on the car was actually being used at that moment to, uh, to generate the audio. And so, so that's actually a very early, this was in the 80s, <laughs> this was uh, uh, early use of uh, selection combining. And, and that's one of the techniques we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, but really, really the motivation here is that, um, you know, almost all the radios that you, uh, you guys use, um, all have, uh, MIMO, or most of them have MIMO capabilities. Even the use, original USARP-1 from 2004 uh, had MIMO capability from, you know, from the beginning. And, but the vast majority of users never use the other channels or they use it as a place to you know, put their other spare antenna um, and then swap, you know, swap between them depending on the project. But I, I wanna, my goal here is to make it so that we can all get um, you know, good use out of and easy uh, low barrier to entry use out of that, uh, those second ports. So um, first in any discussion of uh, MIMO, we have to talk about multipath. Um, I, I'm sure everybody's seen this kind of a picture before, um, but basically uh, channel prop, uh, RF propagation, um, you can sort of divide uh, the, the phenomena into large scale effects, which are uh, you know, the distance and spreading, um, and, and then uh, shadowing and absorption like from trees and things like that. Um, and then the small scale fading, which includes like blockage, let's say it's a phone, you're holding it in your hand or your head, there's blockage there. Um, which will change over time. And so that, that works into fading. And then there's multipath. And that's really what we're mostly going to talk about today. Um, so multipath is a, um, is a phenomenon that can be both constructive or destructive. Um, the, uh, uh, but for the most part, it, it, the, the constructive is not as helpful as the destructive is hurtful in, in most of our communication systems. And so we, we really try to, um, to mitigate this. And so... Um, but what exactly is multipath? Um, we know it's uh, signals bouncing off of things and those things can move and, and the channel can change, but um, how do we characterize it? So first, if we start with um, the main, the main categoriz categorization is, is it frequency selective or flat versus frequency? And then uh, is it rapidly changing or slowly changing? And that, that'll be on the next slide. So, um, so if we look at flat versus frequency selective, um, we know we have uh, a channel with, with all these reflections, but those reflections have to uh, travel further than the main ray. And so there's some excess delay. And the maximum excess delay is the, is the, you know, the worst delay for, for, a, um, for a, a measurable uh, multipath component. Um, and so these are typically modeled with tap delay lines. And um, whether your fading is frequency selective or flat, really depends both on how much excess delay there is, but how much bandwidth you're using. So uh, just like, the, you know, as we always see in the Fourier transform, the longer the time, the narrower the frequency. So if you've got a narrower bandwidth that you care about, it, it's much more likely to be flat fading than if it's wider. Um, now, so how do we deal with um, non-flat fading? Um, in many cases, we can ignore it, but um, usually it should be flattened for, for optimal performance. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so how do we do that? Well, if you've got a single carrier, a single um, frequency uh, uh, signal, then typically you will use a conventional equalizer, which will try to invert the channel, um, or it could be a decision feedback equalizer, which has some advantages, things like that. Um, or you might have a spread spectrum signal, which, which sort of spreads it so that, it's, um, so that the, the frequency selective effects are, are not as bad because you sort of average over a wider bandwidth. Um, or you can use OFDM, and that, that's actually the most common um, way to deal with, with uh, frequency selective multipath is, by, is OFDM, because what you're basically doing is you're taking one wide 
frequency selective channel and turning it into a lot of little, narrow, um, roughly flat channels. And so um, for the rest of this talk, we're actually not going to deal much with the um, frequency selective. It's mostly going to be flat on the assumption that you would, uh, if you had non-flat multipath, you would have fixed it through one of these mechanisms. Um, and then we can really think about it in the, in the flat sense. So um, now there's the question of constant versus time varying. So this normally characterized with uh, what we call Doppler frequency, which is sort of similar to Doppler shifting, like from fast moving objects, but this is more that the, the multipath components are changing delay and amplitude rapidly. And it sort of looks a little bit like Doppler, uh, but it, don't, don't confuse it like with the Doppler you see in satellites. Um, <coughs> so if the Doppler frequency is fast relative to what the sample, uh, uh, the, the symbol period is, then you have what we call uh, f fast fading. But starting from the beginning, we have quasi-static. So that means that the channel may vary, but not during a packet. And you can pretty much estimate the, the channel at the beginning of the, beginning of the packet, let it ride through, and then only re-estimate it for the next, pro um, the, the, the next uh, transmission. Um, next up, there's slow fading, which is during a symbol, it's pretty constant, but during a, uh, over, over a packet, it will change. And so that's typically, that's the most common um, that we see. And, um, and so you do have to track within the packet. Uh, finally, there's fast fading where you have the Doppler frequency is much greater than one over the symbol time. And so uh, that in induces this Doppler modulation. Um, and, and this really, it makes it no longer a linear time invariant system. It's still linear, but it's, it's now time varying. And it induces the picture, what we see on the right, called the Doppler spectrum. And, and it's essentially modulating your signal. And when this gets very bad, it's, it becomes very difficult to, um, to receive. So how do, how do we model multipath? Um, so there's two main uh, distributions that are used, are the Ricean and the Rayleigh. And they're really just probability distributions. I don't think either Rice or Rayleigh did radio stuff. They were probability guys. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, the difference is that Ricean has a line of sight component. And so, whereas Rayleigh is uh, no line of sight component. And um, so what that means is Rayleigh is composed entirely of just the reflections and you don't have the direct path. Um, in, in terms of a difference in modeling, they're actually, if you have this K factor, and so if it's zero, it's, 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 um, it, it's Rayleigh. And if it's non-zero, it's Ricean. And the stronger K is, the more you, energy is in the, in the dominant main path and the less fading you actually get. So a K of infinity is, is just free space, right? There's no, uh, there's no fading at all. And so it's a sort of a sliding scale, but we di differentiate between Ricean and Rayleigh. Um, and then there's the Doppler frequency. That's, that's how quickly it changes. So if you look on the right, this is um, Ricean. And so um, you, know, you have your dominant main component, and then you have these random uh, paths in addition to it. If this, was, if this was Rayleigh, you wouldn't have this orange, and everything would be back here. And so the bigger the dominant component is, the less likely you are to go through the origin. But if there is no dominant component, you're very likely to go through origin. That's when you get the really deep fades, when you have a, a zero amplitude or close to a zero amplitude. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I'm going to show a, a, a demo of this to help us get a feel for it um, within uh, GNU Radio. So it's a pretty simple flow graph. Unfortunately, it doesn't all fit on the screen, so I'll, I'll scroll it for you. But we start with some noise and, and, a, and a constant, and I'll switch back and forth uh, between them with a button. Um, we throttle it, of course. We go through our fading model, which um, is already in GNU Radio. And thanks to whoever wrote this block, it's really good. Uh, I did have one bug, bug fix, but it's really, I, I was like halfway through making my own and then realized it was in there. So that's, that was a great, uh, <laughs> great thing to find. Um, so then we convert it to magnitude squared and you know, essentially get the power of it. And we send it to a histogram and a time sink and, and a frequency sink. So I'm going to run this. And hopefully we'll see it all on the screen. Okay, we don't, we can't see it all at once. Okay, <laughs> um, so first we'll start with uh, uh, a constant signal. So this we're just sending one through through the through the flow graph, and you can see it's just constant here. It's not changing. If I turn on the Doppler frequency, you can see it change. And so the higher the Doppler frequency, the the narrower these these. Um, the, the, the more rapidly the, the path changes, right? This is versus time here. So we'll, we'll slow it down a little bit. And then as we change the K factor, this is at a K factor of zero. So that's, that's um, 
Rayleigh. So it's, it's got really deep fades. You can see occasionally it goes below minus 40. Um, and a, as we increase the K factor, you get more and more direct path. And so the fading gets less and less bad until at maximum, I, I mean, if you made it infinite, this would just be a flat line. And so this is, um, this is uh, it sort of shows the the continuum of of the the different um, the different types of fading, and then um, but if we look at this in the um, in the pro in the uh, histogram, I'm gonna I'm gonna change the k factor. So this is Rice, uh, Rayleigh, and you can see the histogram is it's centered around. So all of these are are the same total power comes in and out on average, right? Sometimes it's a stronger signal, sometimes it's weaker, but on average it's it's um, it, it defaults to zero dB. But you can see, so there's this distribution and you can get, you know, you have significant content down to minus 30 that, that you can see here, but sometimes it's up to, you know, minus seven, or sorry, plus seven or plus eight dB. Um, a, as we increase the K factor, you can see that that distribution narrows. And so it's still centered around zero, but it, it now doesn't get as great on the high side and doesn't get as bad on the low side. And of course, if we, if we make it super, super high K factor, we basically don't have much multipath, and you can see it gets pretty narrow. So now I'm going to switch over to the noise-like waveform and lower the Doppler frequency, and or actually I'm going to turn the Doppler frequency to zero. I'm going to put the K factor pretty low so that we can see this. And we can see this is flat fading because the, the um, because we have no time delay. This is the this is all of those taps in that tap delay line are all at time zero. So we can see that this is flat. And if we we turn up the averaging here, you can see that it comes out to flat. Right now, if we go back to a um, a, a single tone, right, you can see there's a single tone. But as we turn up our Doppler frequency, wish this could all be seen at once. Um, you can see, let's turn up the Doppler frequency some more. And I got to turn up the Turn down the averaging. So here what you can see is this is that Doppler spectrum, sometimes called the Jake's spectrum. And you can see here's our dominant tone right at, right at the middle. Oops. And then these are the, the varying tones. Now there's eight of these because there's eight selected in the in the model, but you can see that this bandwidth is, is, is essentially what I'm setting at the top here. So if I if I reduce that Doppler frequency, right, this gets narrower. This is all still flat fading, but it's frequency varying, and so it causes this content in the frequency domain. So now if we go back here and we switch away from the flat model and into the frequency selective model, you'll see similar um, so let's turn up the K factor. And if we look, and we'll turn this, now we'll do it with noise. And let's turn the Doppler off. And now you'll see that it's non-flat. And that's because there, that, that block is introducing time delay before all of those um, tap, or in between all of those taps. Now, of course, if we turn the Doppler away from zero, it's going to change fast enough you can't really see it. But it is non-flat in there. And it really just depends on how fast you make the channel. But you can see it's non-flat, but it's changing. So, and, and again, we have the same distribution here. Um, and you know, the same dependence on k-factor, but now it's, it's um, frequency selective. So, so that, that's actually going to be the last frequency selective that I, I show um, during this, this demo. Everything else is going to be frequency flat, um, because we'll assume used OFDM or some other technique to, uh, to flatten out. Um, so. So okay, so that's how we model multipath. So now, now we come to MIMO finally. So um, this is the canonical MIMO drawing, um, courtesy of Wikipedia. Um, but the idea is you have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers. And so, and and when they say MIMO, um, it, it multiple input, multiple output. It refers to inputs to the channel, basically how many transmitters you have, and outputs from the channel, how many receivers you have. Um, and you, of course, all of them couple to each other, but in varying amounts. And those, that's the, uh, the coupling or the, or the path loss, and it's denoted with H. So H11 is from antenna 1 to antenna 2. H21 uh, is antenna 1 to antenna 2. Uh, that, that, that's how that um, works. And now we end up with a lot of uh, matrix math at this point, because it makes all of this easier. 
But um, so effectively, you have multiple channels between your various transmit antennas and your various receive antennas. Um, but those channels can be correlated, and some, sometimes they're correlated and sometimes they're not. Um, in general, the further apart the antennas are relative to a wavelength and relative to the physical uh, things that are causing the reflections, um, the, the less your, uh, your, your um, gains will be correlated between each other. Um, and of course, uh, if, there's, if it's free space, er, er, free space, everything will be totally correlated because there's no, um, there's no other uh, effects. Um, so, uh, and, and we can also get uh, diversity through polarization. Of course, that's limited to two ways, either you know, horizontal, vertical, or left, right. Um, but that can be useful um, at small numbers. Um, and so the terminology, as I say, there follows the channel. If you're pedantic, SIMO is one transmit, and MISO is, is uh, one receive. Um, and so now I'm going to show a similar uh, flow graph, um, except this time it is with um, MIMO. And so it's really the same flow graph, except we have two of these fading models, and they're completely decorrelated. Um, but then I have this matrix multiply here, which is fed by a correlation matrix. And so when the correlation factor is one, it, each output is basically the two signals, the two um, matrices added together. And when the correlation factor is zero, they're, they're totally independent. And then we again take the complex to mag squared and, um, and show the, the amplitudes versus time. In, in this, I no longer show frequency because it's flat in frequency. We're not doing, a, we're, we're not doing um, the, the frequency selective channels. So, so it simplifies the display a little bit to not have that second thing. So, okay, so here um, we'll turn up the Doppler frequency, right? And now you can see these are the, this is the channel gain versus time uh, versus um, for the two different paths. So you have signal one and signal two. Now this is with correlation of, uh, of zero and the correlation slider is down here, unfortunately. Um, so, but as I, as I increase the correlation up to one, you can see they become the same. And then, you know, if we, if, you know, if you're somewhere in the middle, like 0.7, right, you can sort of see similarity, but they're not exactly the same. So you'll never see exact, um, correl you know, perfect correlation. Um, and in terms of using MIMO te techniques, the lower the correlation, the better, because you get more diversity out of it. Um, but in, in general, you can get useful results, you know, down to, you know, moderate correlations of, you know, 0.5 or so. And um, uh, now if you, if you don't have, uh, I, I'm sorry, if you do have perfect correlation, um, as if it was free space or, or some other situation where you happen to have the antennas too close to each other, um, then you won't get the same, same level of, um, of uh, uh, improvement from MIMO, but um, you, you may still, oh, we'll scroll down here. Okay, so good. So, um, so that's, that's basically the modeling of the systems that we're, we're working in now. And so, uh, uh, so that, you know, that's, that's what MIMO propagation looks like. And there's, you know, there's other models that are more complicated, but this, this has really the basics. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through a model communication system. And now this is, this is like a full communication system here, right? You start with source coding, channel coding, modulation, all that stuff. And, uh, and, and in some situations you'll have different, um, you know, you may reorder these blocks, but basically you have channel coding, modulation, you would add your MIMO encoding. Then your channelization, whether it's OFDM, root raise, cosine filtering, spreading, whatever it is. Um, and then we have the propagation loss and multipath. And then at the receiver, you get your AWGN, right? And, and, and that's why your, your noise should be decorrelated between the, the, the two um, receivers because it's, it's really receiver noise. Um, even if it's, even if it's um, thermal noise, atmospheric noise, um, the antennas, as long as they're not uh, highly directional, large, like SETI kind of antennas, they will be, they will have independent noise. Um, when they don't have independent noise in radio astronomy, it's because you're doing, you know, or, or you're attempting to do uh, interferometry and you don't want it, you, you do want the correlation and that's how you, you control the direction. But if, for our purposes, you can assume the noise is um, decorrelated here. So then you would do time and frequency sync, dechannel it, and you know, you reverse everything else from the, from the above. Um, so what I'm going to concentrate on today is the stuff that's not blackened there. So we have um, modulation, MIMO encoding, the propagation, AWGN, and then the decoding and demodulation. We left out the, the channelization um, 
and uh, uh, I left out the time sync. I know that's something I've said. You you know you never leave out the the synchronization because that's the that's the hard part. You know, but the textbooks leave it out. We're going to leave it out today for um, for our purposes. But it, it's of course um, important. But all of these flow graphs have the the timing synchronization automatically in there. We still do carrier recovery, but we don't do the timing recovery. So um, so going back to MIMO. So why do we use MIMO techniques? Um, first, increased reliability. We um, effectively get antenna gain. Um, uh, at, at the very least, we effectively get antenna gain through our MIMO techniques, um, and we can increase throughput. Uh, we get get um, path diversity, more reliability, etc. Um, why wouldn't we? Well, there's there's hardware complexity involved. You have to have multiple receive chains, multiple transmit chains. Um, there's al there's significant algorithmic complexity and processing that goes along with it. Um, sometimes, depending on which MIMO methods you, you're using, you need to, ch to pass channel state information. What this means is the receiver needs to report to the transmitter what the channel is looking like so that the transmitter can act on that appropriately. We'll get a little more into that, but that, this overhead can actually be significant if, if, the, if the link is bad and you're really trying to you know, optimize your, your MIMO complexity. And, and often this CSI uh, feedback is, uh, is a limiting factor. Um, and now, Another reason you might also not want to use MIMO is if you have a, uh, a free space system, um, then uh, true phase rate beamforming is much easier. You could do it in the analog domain, um, or the math is easier, even if you do it in the digital domain, uh, and it's you can point beams. And, and if there's no multipath, you're going to get the same results as if you just did beamforming. So that that's easier in those situations. So um, so to to divide up the the various techniques. Um, we have received diversity, uh, and, and we'll go over three, three different varieties of that. There's antenna selection, um, equal gain combining, maximal ratio combining. Um, there's transmit diversity, uh, where we also have similar, similar options. Um, we have space-time coding, um, which we'll, we'll show an example of that as well. And, um, and you know, sort of the true MIMO, the, the, the sort of advanced MIMO stuff um, where you would have what's called spatial multiplexing or pre-coding, and there's a bunch of other techniques um, uh, around that, and, and we'll, we'll cover that a little. We don't have a, um, a demo of those. Uh, and then there's massive MIMO, and I'll cover a little bit of that um, at the end. So, um, so I, I, I've talked a lot about diversity, but what does that really mean? So um, we, we kind of intuitively know that, that um, diversity, in, in paths means that you know if one's bad the other might be good right um, and so we can still communicate in that situation so uh, but it, it's actually it, it can be quantified too it's not it's not just this sort of um, fuzzy uh, concept and so um, we have what's called diversity order and if you're able to extract the full diversity it, it will improve um, your 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 links in in these fading scenarios so so this is just a, a plot of a simple communication system, and I, you probably can't tell the colors very well, but this, this, this line here is the bit error rate uh, for this communication system versus um, uh, in, in, in just a Gaussian channel with no fading. And you can see you ha it has that characteristic um, rapid drop off as, as the, the SNR increases. And you know, so it just takes a little bit of increased SNR to radically drop your bit error rate. Um, but when you have a um, a faded channel, it turns out that it's not it, it, you you lose that that steep slope, um, and and now now why is that right? We're we're basically saying that whereas before a one dB could give you a huge drop off, now it takes many dB to get the same kind of drop off. So why is that? Well, if you have fades of thirty dB, then adding one you know that are five percent of the time, let's say adding one dB, will maybe you'll have those fades you know, you know, 4.9% of the time, right? You, you won't get uh, the same advantage. It's almost like you have something, it, it's effectively binary, either the channel's there or it's not. And so you get these deep fades and, and, and thus you have to add lots of SNR in order to really get the low bit error rates, right? And this is the primary problem of fading channels. And this becomes, rather than this sort of logarithmic drop-off or, or uh, exponential drop-off, this is, becomes a very linear um, drop-off. So, <coughs> so, um, so what happens when we add diversity? So if we can get full diversity of order two, 
then you can see we can go from here to this line. Now, what is this saying? This is saying if there was maybe a 5% chance of, of, uh, of the, one of these deep fades that you can't, can't deal with, um, with one antenna, but if they're totally uncorrelated, well, the chance of them both being uh, deeply faded at once is, you know, is, is 0.05 times 0.05, right? It becomes a much smaller number. Um, and so the more diversity um, you have, the, 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 the closer you can get to the ideal curve, right? Um, so this is with two, this is with four. Now you can get this diversity on the, on the transmit side, or on the receive side, or you can get it on, as a combination. Um, but diversity two, you should think of as it's, you know, two receivers or it's two transmitters. Diversity four could either be four receivers, it could be four transmitters, which is less common, uh, or you might have two of each, right? But as the numbers go up, you, you, your diversity is, is, the, is, is, is basically how many independent paths you have. So, right, the chance of all four of those, if they're totally independent paths, being deeply faded is extremely low. And that, that's what we're showing here. So, um, so, so that's, that's what we mean when we talk about the diversity number. And if you're, if you're good at your mechanisms, whether you're doing selection or equal gain combining, if you do them right, you'll get that full diversity. So, <coughs> so here I list three different mechanisms to achieve diversity. One is antenna selection, which in code is just, you know, take the stronger of, of A or B, right? So it's pretty easy. And actually, usually, and, and that's what my friend's parents' car had when I was a kid. Um, but it's, it's really easy. And, and typically, if you're doing this, you're, you're, you're usually doing it uh, uh, entirely analog. You're not doing it in, in code like this, because if you've gone to the effort of, of demod you know, getting two signals into the radio, you wouldn't bother using this method. But if you have, say, a pow two power detectors, you can rapidly switch between the two signals. And that's, that's what their, you know, their car radio was doing. Um, and you kind of have to track the carrier because when you switch between the two, it'll glitch. And if it's FM, you hear a little click. Or, or um, uh, but, but, but in general, it's a very easy system. Um, then we have what's called equal gain combining. You just add the two together. Again, they, you have to track the carriers, or if you add them together, they won't they won't line up. But if you're tracking both carriers and you add them, uh, that that improves the signal because you're you're adding the signal from both of them, and and they add in power. Sorry, they add in voltage, which is, uh, which is better, and it, the noises will add in power, and so you will you will get a net gain there. And so that's equal gain combining. Then there's maximal ratio combining, which is provably optimum, where the stronger say where you add them, but you you apply gain to the stronger signal, not the weaker one. So if one is twice as strong as the other, when you add them together, you first multiply that one by two. And, and that, that emphasizes the stronger one. And it turns out that's the exact same math that, hap that, that happens in beamforming. And so, uh, except this is sort of adaptive, so, it, so you don't have to know I'm pointing in this direction. And in multipath, it's not a, it doesn't form like a direct beam, but it's effectively the same thing, and you're, you're, you're beamforming, and so you get 3 dB of antenna gain if you do this. You get almost 3 dB probably if you're equal gain. It depends on the statistics. But maximal ratio will get you the full 3 dB if there's no fading. Um, so even if there's no fading, these are useful because you're collecting twice as much energy, right? You have two antennas, so you have two buckets, and you can add that energy together if you do it properly. Um, but when there's, of course, multipath, then it, the, the benefit is much larger, right? And so, um, and so that's what I'll show in a moment. Um, but again, maximal ratio, you not only have to track the carrier, you have to, fit, you have to estimate the SNR, which is actually n not always that easy, especially at low SNRs. Um, so let, I'm going to show a flow graph that demonstrates that. Um, actually, before I show that, I'm going to show um, my, my tabs got rearranged here. So I'll just show the, the blocks I made. So equal gain combining is easy, right? It comes in, you add them together. It's already carrier synchronized before this, right? So this one was very straightforward. Um, Selection combining, it's a little more complicated in the flow graph because I tried to do it without writing code and there was, it's hard to find a, something that will say, oh, this one's stronger, pick it. So, but effectively all this, all this you know, math in there is just figuring out which one is stronger, the, the argmax block is doing that, and then we're choosing which one to pass through uh, to the output. So, so that's uh, selection combining. And it, these are both, I, I'm doing all two-way here, but you, all these can be, you know, increase to four-way, eight-way, however many you want. 
And of course, selection combining will continue to lose to the others because the others are actually adding all the energy where this is just picking one and you won't get any antenna gain, you'll just get the diversity. Um, and then we have uh, maximal ratio combining, which is the most um, conceptually complex and algorithmically complex, but it's the, the block diagram is a little bit simpler, but essentially we're, we're measuring and then averaging the incoming signal levels and, and then multiplying those signal levels times that. Now, you also really are supposed to track the noise, but the noise is, in these situations, the noise is the same. Um, so, so it simplifies it a little bit. It, ideally, this would be written just out in code, but this is a, um, yeah, I kind of like to see it as, as a flow graph, right? So we have the two signals coming in, and they pass through these multiply blocks and added together, and then uh, they're scaled by the, the sum of the uh, powers and then comes out, and then this, this stuff up here is just the power estimation, the SNR estimation. So, so here's the, the flow graph that uses this. So we start with just a, you know, a audio source. Um, it, it generates, um, it converts to bits, right? We convert those bits to plus and minus one. So this is all BPSK. All of this works BPSK, QPSK, QAM, you know, whatever. Um, but we're, we're doing all BPSK here today. Um, and now I put a little bit carrier in here because we have to estimate the carrier we have to um, synchronize. So I add a carrier by muxing in some ones. Every eight, every eight useful bits, I have one bit of, uh, of pilot. And so we send that through this correlated Rayleigh uh, channel. Um, same thing goes to both of them, but it's two, two different channels. Uh, so this is transmit, this is over the air. And then on the receivers, right, we have two receivers. So we demux the, um, the carriers, and the carriers go into these carrier regeneration blocks. Um, and, uh, and uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, ca the carrier goes into the carrier regeneration block, which we then um, multiply conjugate to get to take that back out of the signal. And so we, we've transformed back to uh, DC. And then we, we, we put it through the three methods, equal gain, maximal ratio, and selection combining. And, um, and we can output it to audio, but we can also uh, show the constellation. And I'll show the five, it's easier to see on the three, but we'll, we'll, start, with, we'll start with the five and then I'll, it, it, but the, the display is pretty, pretty busy. Um, so anyway, so going back here, we also show the, the direct paths um, without the, without the, as if you just had one reception. So, so we'll, we'll run this. And so we got, we can add noise here, right? We'll, you know, we can add more noise or less. So this is a decent amount. Um, Doppler will change the channel and you can see it moving around. We'll, we'll leave it there. We can correlate it and you can see how, hey, let's turn the Doppler on and I'll also turn the K factor down, right? So here we've got multipath. Now you, you're seeing five things there, right? So path one is blue. Now you don't really see the blue much because it's, it's um, followed by the selection a lot. Um, uh, path two, and then uh, the green is equal gain combining, and the purple is the maximal ratio combining. So you can see even when like the blue fades and the red doesn't, or the red fades and the blue doesn't, the the green and and the purple stay pretty good, right? And and let me turn it, make it a little worse so you can see it um, see it better here. Right, you see everything's moving around, but the green and the purple move around a lot less. Um, so it's a little hard to see here, but so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna switch over to the just so show three of them at once, and I think this is equal gain combining. Yeah, so this is the equal gain combining. Okay, so now you can see. Um, let me turn up the Doppler. It's changing and the K factor. Right, you can see that. Sometimes the red is bad, sometimes the blue is bad, but the green is always pretty decent, except when they both the red and the blue go into the middle, right? But now if we, if we were in a, in a correlated setup, you know, where the, where the two antennas are too close to each other and they're no longer independent, the green fades with it, right? So we no longer get our diversity and the green is, is staying there. Now, I'm gonna turn the Doppler down just to make this display really. Now, one thing you can see is, if I can turn this down, there we go. Um, if we zoom in, or actually maybe in two more far, you can see here it's it's kind of subtle, but the red and the blue are are further out than the green, and that's the three dB you get from the antenna gain in the fully correlated case, right? Normally, 
um, if, if we had selection here, and I, I, you know, the, the, the selection would just go out uh, as far as the red and the blue did, right? Because it, it, it would, um, it would uh, not be combining the energy of the two. But here we combine the energy and we scaled it back, and that's why you see that the green is better. So that's our antenna gain in the case of no, you know, of, uh, of, of um, uh, the, 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 essentially the no multipath, right? Now let's go back to the Doppler, and right, and you can see it's still, even, even when they're together, sorry, in the case of full correlation, when, when um, even when they're together, the green is better, but you know, when there's no correlation, right, you get the much, much better setup. Does anybody have any questions on, on any of that to this point? Okay. Good. So, so that's the, the, the correlation. Uh, that, that's the, um, the received diversity. And now I'm just going to um, just, I, I'm going I'm to switch this over to audio. So it's not just the, um, the, the, the constellation display, but it's audio. So I, I, I want you to listen closely so you hear the, um, the effects of the fading over time uh, and how, how it affects the audio. So, so, so you can see actually if we if we um, turn up the correlation and we make the fading bad as it drops out, you'll hear. And of course, we have too little noise here. We get more noise. You'll start to hear it click. But that's pretty good there. That's with high correlation. Oh, here, I should do it like this. So that's a lot of noise and. So right, you're starting to hear it go bad there, but um, but it's still it's still here. You know, you can still hear it. But when we turn up the correlation, right, you lose it, right? Because we're the um, what what we're having there is is again when it's uh, not correlated, we're, we get the gain of uh, the diversity gain, and when it is correlated, you um, you 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 lose that. You still get your three dB of um, of uh, antenna gain, which is why we were able to go to uh, such a bad SNR and still um, still hear it. So, um, okay, so that was received diversity. So now let's go to transmit diversity. Okay, so now transmit diversity is actually incredibly similar. Um, you have antenna selection, you, uh, which you, know, you, you, you choose, and again, you get no gain because of that. Um, no, no power gain, no diversity gain, uh, no, no antenna gain, but you do get diversity gain. Um, the, 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 Downside of this versus the receive uh, stuff is that the receiver has to tell the transmitter which is the better antenna at any point. So the, the higher the Doppler rate, the, the more bits per second are wasted in the reverse to tell the transmitter which antenna to choose. Um, but it's, you know, it's one bit. But um, uh, now if the, if the channel is very slow, that you, you could send a bit every, few, you know, every second or so, right? Whereas if it's very fast, it has to be quicker. And at some point, it changes quicker than your latency of the link, and you can't, you can't do that. Uh, and, and it doesn't doesn't provide any gain. Um, the other choice is maximal ratio transmission, um, which is really trans is the reverse of MRC, and it gives the same diversity gain, um, but it, uh, it which is uh, transmit beamforming, and so it it provides antenna gain. So again, if you were to measure this, you would actually if you were to look at it in free space with the two coefficients, you are effectively pointing a beam. Now with with only two antennas, it's not much of a beam, right? But you're you're pr providing gain in one direction. Um, and if it's um, uh, more antennas, it would be a finer and finer beam. Um, now, if um, there, there's other techniques beyond this, both for MRC and MRT, um, it, sometimes if there's interference rather than just noise that you're worried about, um, it, it can be better to sacrifice a little bit of gain that you get from MRC or MRT, which is the maximum gain. Sometimes you sacrifice a little bit of gain in exchange for putting a null on, on the interferer. Now, if it's just Gaussian noise, there's no no concept of that because it's you know it's uniform. But um, but if there is an interferer that you want to get rid of, you you can use these and they're called zero forcing techniques. But it's essentially just pointing a null in the direction of the interferer, um, and you can point one null for every extra antenna you have. Um, and so, uh, but that's you know, of course, in the, certainly in the case of TX diversity, needs a lot more um, uh, channel state information, right? The MRT and and that would require a lot of uh, um, CSI, um, but but you know often like in cell phone uh, systems, we use this for quite a while. Um, even 
Um, Wi-Fi will sometimes use channel st state information depending on the mode, um, and uh, so that the transmitter can, um, you know, point the point the the signal where it wants. Okay, so next we come to space-time coding. Um, now, the the great thing about space-time coding is that it doesn't require channel state information at the transmitter. Yet the trans the transmitter can do um, uh, MIMO with it. And so um, what what it what this means is because it's the no channel state information, the transmitter doesn't know how to point the energy in the right direction. So there's no antenna gain from this, but you still can get the diversity gain. Um, and so the way you do that, the easy way, the, the sort of the, um, the, the first way that was discovered to do this is called Alamudi coding. Uh, and it, you know, the general family of, of these things is called space-time block coding. Or if you do it in OFDM and you put, you know, rather than, so space-time block coding means the, the code symbols you do sequentially. So A then B, A then B. Um, whereas space frequency block coding would mean you just put them on adjacent carriers in the, um, in, in, in your OFDM, but it's, it's the same, it's the same math. Um, and so, uh, uh, and you could actually do it in CDMA. I've never seen anybody actually do it, but there's no reason you couldn't. There's two, two orthogonal um, signals. You can just uh, do that in the, in, the, in, the, in the coding domain as well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so anyway, Alamudi coding um, is, this is as close as you get sort of a, to a free lunch in, in, in comm systems. Um, you get, uh, it, it, but if you have only two antennas, you can do um, full rate, which means you don't give up any data rate and you don't widen your bandwidth and you get the same data rate through. And it's fully orthogonal, which means you, you would get the, the, full, um, the full diversity gain of the system and, and, and there's no um, uh, impact of one symbol on another. Um, it's been extended beyond two antennas, but you, can't, you either you have to give somewhere. You, you, you either have to, um, except reduced orthogonality or reduced diversity or, um, or slow down the data rate so that you can do this because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't perfectly scale. But there are some versions that go up to like four antennas, eight antennas. Like Wi-Fi has, a, I think, a four and an eight antenna or three and a four and a, uh, maybe an eight antenna version um, in there. So but you, you give up a little. But in any case, the idea is it, it, if you look at this matrix, you have C1 and C2, which means that... Um, uh, this, so the columns are your antennas and the rows are your time slots. So let's say I have two bits that I would normally send called C1 and uh, C2. I would send C1 and then I would send C2. So instead I send C2, C1 and C2 at the same time but on different antennas. And then the next time period I send the negative conjugate of C2 from the first antenna and the conjugate of C1 on the second antenna. Now um, what this means is that each symbol is going on both antennas but it also means you have two, two bits in two times, and so we don't lose any data rate. That's why this is called a full rate code. Um, so what this does is, is now the receiver gets a picture of both signals coming from two different, across both paths. And so um, there's, a, there's a sort of a matrix inversion you can do that gets the, um, the, uh, uh, the symbol separated again, right? Because they're mixed here, but then you would get it separated again and, and be able to separate them at the receiver. So, so I'm gonna show uh, this. Um, so we can do, this is the Alamudi encoder, which is basically just that matrix, you know, that matrix that I showed you, um, where you source in, I, I multiply by half, right, because you can't, you don't want, you know, cheat, you have, a, you, you know, if you have one watt on one antenna, you have to go to half a watt on each to make the, the math fair, right? Um, now, if, if you happen to be limited by antenna power, then, uh, sorry, by amplifier power, then adding a second one gets you more power, but that's that's cheating in the comm system sense, right? You 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 have to divide the power equally between the two. Um, so we, we we separate the 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 streams, and um, uh, and and so we take we do, we do the math on them, and uh, so you take pairs of symbols essentially that come out of the two ports of the stream to streams. Uh, one goes back in. And is uh, uh, and then the other is um, yeah it, it, basically this, this does the math on it um, it, it it does that uh, complex conjugate and 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 takes the um, so so the the, the C one right so the, this is easier if I do it this way so C you know C one would come out here and would come out the first antenna at the first time period C two would come out the second antenna at the first time period. 
and then the, the, the processed ones cross, right? You cross the streams here, it's allowed in this case. Um, complex conjugate, and then you multiply by negative one, and this one's just complex conjugate, and those become the second symbol on the two respective antennas. So, so that was easy to do in uh, uh, GNU Radio uh, in, in using uh, hierarchical blocks. Uh, the receive is more complicated, and I just, just went to uh, math in Python for that. So first we have to estimate the channel. So this is just a, a Python block. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but basically uh, we have the constructor and we just have this, this matrix that is the known symbol that we, that we send in the pilot, right? So we just send a 1-1 one, one in the pilot and that gets Alamudi encoded along with all the data. And so here we just, this is the, the matrix that we're gonna need to invert it. And then every time we receive, we basically multiply by the, inver the inverted um, thing and that tells us what the channel coefficients are from the two antennas to R1, right? Remember, this is single receive on this, in this example. And then the actual receiver then takes, takes those um, estimated channel uh, vectors, uh, channel coefficients, it makes its own vector out of them, inverts that, and then, um, and then that gets multiplied by the incoming signal, and then that comes out. And so if we look at that in the, um, Alamudi demo, right? So we, we again have our, our, our data source. Um, we, we go to the Alamudi encoder and we have channel gains for the two separate channels. And then we add in noise. And then on the receive side, we're, we're demuxing out the pilots, right? The, so the pilots get demuxed out, they go to the estimator and it has an alpha so you can average the estimates over, over time periods, although I didn't implement that part yet. So it's, it's just, it's not averaging them. So uh, you'll see the noise grows a little bit and I'll, I'll point that out. Um, and then we display the, the estimates and then it goes into the receiver, you know, the same, the same estimates go into the H path on the receiver and the, the, the data comes into the in path on the receiver and it, it you know, demodulates it and comes out and it'll show it as, uh, you know, as a constellation. So um, turn the noise down a little bit. So here you can see the, uh, this upper one, is this, this is the estimates. So here I'm setting the path gains, right? And you can see it's estimating the path gains. That's H2, that's H1, right? And you can, and you know, even if you have one path gain is, is off, right? Essentially, you, you, know, you disconnected one antenna and you only have signal coming through the other. There's still enough information there for the receiver to receive it, right? That's the, that's the, the I, I unhooked the antenna version, or the, I've got two, two uncorrelated paths and one is incredibly bad, right? So you could still receive it. it you won't get the, the, the improvement in that case, but, um, but at some other time, then a different one will go to zero. Now, if I happen to pull both of these to zero, the, the flow graph dies because it's a singular matrix and I need to you know, catch that in, in an, as an exception. But um, you could see what it does here. And then down here, you could see the blue is what, what comes into the antenna. Right, and you can see it's it's got this weird point in the middle. That's because we're summing both both signals coming in, and so it uh, so sometimes one positive, one's negative, and they they go to the center. Right, so you obviously can't just decode. You have to do the math to decode it, and that's what the red is. Right, but if I if I were to um, to change this, you could see that right the two different paths have two different gains, and that's why the blue sort of bifurcates like that but the red stays uh, correct because it's, it's estimated. Now, I'm gonna turn the noise up a little. So now, now and I turned the noise up and now as we drop the amplitude of the, of the path gains, right, you're gonna see that the, it all gets equalized. So the, sig the, the, the red signal amplitude stays the same, but the noise amplitude grows because Right, we have worse and worse channels, right? But, but what you see is when one is really bad and the other one's good, we've got a good signal. And, and if the other one's really good, we still have a good signal. But as they both approach zero, that's when it, it goes bad. So obviously when you have the really, if it's either highly correlated or they both happen to, to go to poor paths at the same time, that's when you, you know, the diversity is not sufficient. And, and you know, it's not magical, it's not gonna, um, decode a signal from, from nothingness. So that's the Alamudi demo. And any, any questions so far? Okay.
almost done here. So that's the space-time coding. Um, I didn't, you know, there's the more complicated versions with more antennas, but um, uh, that's, you know, the, the same basic concept. Um, now, I don't have demos for the rest of it, but um, we'll talk a little bit about the more advanced MIMO stuff. So um, the first technique is called pre-coding, and w w this is basically the transmitter is able to, f yes, oh, oh, five minutes? Okay. So the, in this, in this um, method, the transmitter knows what the receiver channel is, but there's multiple antennas on each side, so the transmitter has to know all of those coefficients. So if the ch transmitter has four antennas and the receiver has four, that's 16 coefficients that have to somehow be communicated to the transmitter. But once it knows those, those coefficients, it's able to do, and usually it uses a sing singular value decomposition to do this, but you're able to figure out which, uh, what, what sort of pre-coding matrix, what to multiply the transmitted signals by in order to send energy to particular paths. And so um, you can effectively create the minimum of the N and M and N parallel ch channels here, right? And you can direct energy to each of them that will be coherently received at the other side. And this other side still has multiple antennas so that, you know, because there's separate channels that may land on one or the other. And, and, and so it also gets diversity. Um, but you can, um, but in, in also in a frequency selective situation, it may also be doing this in the frequency domain. And so it's directing energy, not just to particular paths physically, but also into particular frequencies, right? So if you have one frequency with a null, there's no point in sending energy there. So pre-coding will put it in a, in a, in a band that's good. So that's, what, that's how you could take advantage of the improvement of um, the SNR, uh, when the when the fading is in your favor, right? You, you, when, when it goes above the zero line, you, you, this helps you take advantage of that. So um, this is this is uh, more complicated. It's, uh, and I, I have some Python code that does it, but it uh, doesn't work. It didn't get it into the demo. Um, but this allows an increase in the bit rate, um, both both because you have stronger channels and also you have multiple channels, right? You can send multiple things at once. Um, and this, of course, can also be used with what's called multi-user MIMO, where you're sending different things to different users at the same time. Um, again, you know, by, by um, you know, having different uh, pre-coding matrices to tra transmit to each one. Um, and uh, so then, the, so, so of course, that needs a lot of CSI. Um, so the, the final technique that, I'm, that I list here is called spatial multiplexing. And the advantage of spatial multiplexing is you don't need any channel state and the transmitter can just, essentially just sends a separate stream on each antenna. And, and it, it's like, it's up to the receiver to figure it out. And, um, it, and, and this is also, there's modes for this um, spatial multiplexing in, um, in Wi-Fi as well, in the, in the, you know, the newer ones. Um, and so if you have eight antennas on the transmitter and four antennas on the receiver, you can send four streams to that user. Um, if you have eight on each end, you can send eight parallel streams. Now, it turns out that um, even, even if there's a lot of multipath, you don't really have eight good channels, or if there's eight and eight, you, you'll have some number less than that. So typically there's like one super strong channel and then some, some others, uh, but with spatial multiplexing, you can't, you can't choose that, right? So you have to sort of code across it. Whereas with pre-coding, you can choose, oh, this, this one channel's really good, I'm gonna put all my energy there, and this other channel is not as good, I'll only do BPSK on that channel or something like that. So, so spatial multiplexing really, really, on the other hand, leaves it up to the receiver to decode. And, and it, this is where you hear about sphere decoders and things like that. Um, essentially, the receiver has, if, if there's four transmitter antennas and four receive antennas, and all signals are sent at the same time, on each receive antenna, it, it'll receive all four of those streams. But because it has four pictures of it with different relative phases on each, if there's enough multipath diversity, it's able to decode that and separate them. But, um, but certainly, it's, it, it would be always advantageous to use pre-coding if, if you had the CSI in order to do that. But, um, but of course, that's not always available. So the final technique um, is, is massive MIMO. And this is a, a picture I've used many times as a setup at the University of Lund in Sweden, where they had um, 64x310s, which each had um, in two antennas. So it was 100. Is it? No. Yeah, it was a 128-way uh, MIMO, um, and and in massive MIMO, typically it's not 128 on each side. It's it's a you know 128 or 64 or 32 on one side, and then it's like a handheld with one or two antennas on the other side. Um, but what you have here is you have this continuous CSI feedback, and um, the the antenna is essentially attempting to invert the channel so that it can put 
a beam right at one user. Now these beams may not be sort of a fan beam, like a directional beam, like you're, you're thinking of when I say beam, it can actually be more of a cloud, right? If, if it's very diverse multipath, it won't be a straight path. It will be, you know, everything combines coherently here and even right behind it, it might not. And so as you move, it has to keep adjusting. So there's a lot of CSI to do that. Um, and so I, I call that eigen beam forming um, versus you know conventional beam forming. Um, and uh, but again, if there's no multipath, this would just uh, you know sort of collapse down to a, a, a phased array antenna. Um, and there's a couple of methods. Um, you know, MRC and MRT just aim as much energy as possible to a certain point. Um, but then there's also zero forcing or null steering, which um, also tries to make at, at one user it, it, it sends. Um, you know, a cloud to them, but also nulls out every other user's uh, signal at that place. And so that's a lot more computation. And, you know, so there's a big pile of FPGAs underneath that that does all of that, com com uh, all those combinations in this, but you're able to effectively create individual clouds for each user. And it just, as, you, as they move around or as the channel changes, you have to keep adapting. So unfortunately, we don't have a demo of that. That uh, wouldn't fit in the overhead. So, um, so anyway, that's uh, that's what I've got on on MIMO. Are there um, any questions? Silence. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs>